Uh, hi, my name is Tim Zager. I'm here with uh, magician extraordinaire Michael Amar. We're here in Kansas City at the Off Broadway Theater. Uh, we just experienced an amazing oh, thank you. Uh, thank uh, you so lecture. Much, and uh, uh, what I really liked about it was it, it wasn't a typical lecture I'm used to seeing trick, 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 trick. Uh, exactly. And, that, and, and that's what felt good for me. When I'm on a lecture tour and I really hit my stride, I try to compact as much stuff as I can into the experience. But it's so rare when I get to do a freestanding event like this. You know, freestanding right. lecture like the only time like this this year. And, uh, and it felt good to be more freeform with it. Well, great. We were uh, very excited to have you here. And it was so nice. So people would ask questions and they would truly seemed engaged and that felt good right you know well I talked to a few people uh, who had some questions we wanted to find out a little bit about the my, the man Michael uh -oh. <laughs> here we go we have nothing's been down. rearranged we don't know uh, concentrate do I have to are you going to ask it or do I have to just answer <laughs> yeah let's concentrate. do the car next. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, want, you want to do that uh, I, I read somewhere Michael that uh, you were drawn to magic from a uh, ad in a comic book, 250 tricks for 50 cents. Yeah, Douglas Magic Land. It was a, like, no, it was for 25 cents. You 25 cents, all right. All these things. Uh, and I thought, wow, uh, like a, it's like less than a penny a trick. You know, but it was a catalog. That was where I, yeah, I learned to read the ad. Do you, still, do you still have it? The Douglas Magic Land catalog? I, I believe I do. Yeah, was, I still was, have that. Do you remember some of the tricks in there? that? Uh, oh, yeah. This was the day of just looking at these images and using your imagination and there's this vanishing fish bowl on a pole and, and um, Bongo's Blooming Bush was one, was one of the first ones that I ordered. Bongo's Blooming Bush. Oh, is this the newspaper thing? <laughs> Where, when you read the description, you see a beautiful bush with various colored flowers on it and you pluck these flowers and the flowers change into scars. And once you have a handful of these scars, it turns into a foulard yeah. and you cover the bush and it reblooms. And I, and it was like $15. And, and uh, you still use it today. And I thought, oh, that's a lot of magic for 15 bucks. And then it, it came in a little box that was like this big and it's like, How's that positive? You can't get a yeah. bush and all these flowers in this box, and, and it turned out to be a little flower pot with little wire things and, yeah. and, and uh, little crumbled up scars as flowers. But you know, I had such high expectations from reading the ad. I thought this was going to be a whole show. You know, oh, sure. All you'd need. Um, I but, think I, I remember something like that. Uh, this uh, amazing prediction trick and. They sound so I, amazing. I, I feel I get like it, it's a little uh, thing you stick under your fingernail. Yeah, and sometimes I feel like it's just better to hand out the catalog, just say, "Look, you guys read about it." You know, and it's just like it's so much better this way. <laughs> so you've been in Magic a long, long time. Uh, you grew up in West Virginia. Yes, I did. Is, is that where you uh, met Bill Smith? Was was yes, your, Bill your, Smith your was first uh, a local mentor? magician that kind of took me under his wing? And how, how did that happen? Did you approach him or? Uh, no, he heard that I liked magic and then like did a, a trick for me. He's like, wow, that's amazing. You have to teach me how to do yeah. this. And the biggest thing for me growing up was to realize that I could do it. I didn't think that this was something that just anybody could do. I thought you had to be like the seventh son or the seventh son. Or, uh, but when I realized that it's attainable if you put your mind to it. And I, you know, checked out every book in the library and just became very passionate about it. Mm -hmm. absorbing everything I could. Now, it seems like things are quite different these days. Uh, you, you don't hear too much about people having a mentor. I mean, mm -hmm. do you do you have any advice for young students today to seek out a mentor? <laughs> How does that process really work? Well, you know, the way it worked with me and the professor, you know, I just hung around as much as I could and and would try hard to show him that I listened. 
to what he would say. I would show him something, and if he would make some comment on it, you know, I would absolutely rework it and so that the next time I would see him, it would be clear. I followed up on your advice, and I do this, and I do this, and now I, and after a while, people like to think that somebody's listening and, and sure. taking advice and, and trying to apply these things, and eventually, it just uh, became, well, uh, I guess you realize you're not going to go away, are you? I might as well start talking to you and, and watch what you do. And, um, and to a certain extent, people just want to, to know that somebody's serious. There's been many times when, um, you know, I can see that they're not just expecting the advice to roll out, that somebody's bringing something to the table and they're bringing effort. And, and I'm always happy to to help and protect, because that's what I always got. Right, right. You know, and I really feel like I have a lot of that to kind of, uh, you know, just kind of get back. back. Yeah, you know, right. Yeah. So when you, when you uh, uh, first started putting a, a show together, I understand it was more of a stand-up act, mm -hmm. traditional stuff like doves, uh, rings, uh, so some of the In the, the beginning, uh, yeah. I went to uh, the 1976 uh, convention in the, at the Bellevue Stratford Hotel okay. in Philadelphia, and that was the hotel that had the Legionnaires' disease. The next week, uh, after the magicians were there, the Legionnaires came in, and then that whole episode took place. But that was a wonderful convention. It, was that the year you were named the uh, Magician of the Year by? Uh, what was oh, the Mount Saint Mystics. Mount Saint Mystics. Yeah. Well, yeah. after that convention, I was going back to college, and I'm just you know, so gung-ho for magic that, um, yeah, the Mount State Mystics was a group there, including Paul Spinago, John Andrews, um, a bunch of magicians there, and Morgantown. Oh, it was just an informal group? It wasn't uh, mm -hmm. like an IBM or SAM type group? I, I think it was an SAM. Okay. It was an SAM uh, uh, assembly, and but it was the magicians there at the university. So was that your first uh, experience with competing? A group of magicians. and. Okay. and um, I don't think that, that was an actual competition so much as each month we would say who contributed the most to the okay. month and, and whoever's like the magician of the month the most is now the magician of the year. Now wasn't it the, the next year that you performed at uh, the Magi Fest? It, it, is this, uh, is not it? quite the next year. It was 79 was the okay. year that I performed at the Magi Fest and it, had everything go wrong. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can see where this, yeah, I, um, it was, it, what it I was heard it was le these, less than uh, desirable, it, you, you weren't too happy with yourself. Oh, it was, it was, it like, was really uh, I've done with tragic. tragic, it was terrible. You gave your stuff away. Yeah, it, it, was, I mean, it was as bad as it could get. And uh, I mean, I could if I wrote out a show and said, "Go!" I think of everything that could possibly go wrong. You wouldn't think of of everything. Sure. You know, it's just like, and to have it all go wrong at the same time was just it was it was fate because it wasn't the right thing for me to be doing. And, and it was, it had slowly taken on a life of its own, and this was turning into this hardcore manipulation, six or seven birds, candles, and, and all this stuff. That was 1979. You know, the world didn't need another Lance Burton. Right. Even before, you know, that would have been right about that so time. So is this about the time when you came back to... The more as a close-up person then? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was somewhat tragic in this respect. Uh, my family had said, okay, um, we'd had this conversation about whether or not I should do magic for a living or work mm -hmm. at the family restaurant, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and we'd had the, the big father-son talk. It was, like, you know, it was a really busy day. It was Mother's Day. Was, it, was uh, this a chain of uh, uh, bonanza? Oh, bonanza, bonanza okay. steakhouse, and uh, and I'm running the fry station, and Dad comes in, and he says, "Oh, hey, my, oh, hey, Dad, uh, you know," and he goes, "Wait, no, son, look, look at all this business here." And I'm, 
oh yeah, okay, so it's extra fries and some Texas toast. No, 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 son. Someday. Oh, he wanted you to take over. All of this is going to be yours. And I, and it was so ironic because he really meant for this to be that father-son moment. And for me, it was, it was just, it all became good. No, no, I, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. Uh, and I guess, well, you don't, you don't run the fries forever. You know, you, there's sure. beverages, there's the broiler. You can, we're going to move you up the chain. And it's like, no, I'm not happy doing this. You know, this I know, I've done enough to know, this doesn't make me happy. And, and so there was a big debate about it in, in time of it. Is it better to be happy and hungry <laughs> or, you know, fed and, and unhappy? And, and, and I said, you know, I'd rather be happy, even if I make less money. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm going to prove it. If you just give me two years, I can, I'll either make progress, visible progress, or I'll come back and I'll run the bonanza. And for me, it was it, like learning what I didn't want to do was really important. Because I knew I, I don't want to do this. And so for him to say, this is all going to be yours, that was like the most motivational speech I'd ever heard. It's like, oh no. I'll practice, I'll practice all day if I have to, but I'm yeah. not going to do this. Uh, and, and I've so noticed that a lot of people do that. Do that. They, the, by contrast, they find out what they don't want. And, and it helps them. Helps and that's why I, I'm a firm believer of, of kids, teenagers, having jobs like this, where it's a lot of work and it's mm -hmm. not very much money, so that they understand. This is the kind of job you'll have the rest of your life if you don't decide to become good at something. See, if you don't choose something, something like this is gonna be chosen for you. So think about that as you mow the grass this summer. <laughs> if you wanna do this yeah. the rest of your life, <laughs> or if you'd rather decide to 